<clears throat> Good day, everybody, and welcome uh, to our Genesis class live from Jerusalem with Rabbi Chaim Goldberg of the Noahide World Center. Uh, it's one of my favorite classes every week, so uh, let's just tune right in and see how the rabbi is doing today. Good evening, everybody. Good evening from Jerusalem. Good to see you all. Good to see um, also uh, some um, new people that are coming in the, with us. Excellent. It's, it's always a joy to see everybody from all over the world. I think that one of the most uh, important things that we have in this class is that we can, we can show the world that we can be from a lot of places, but still have the same aim, the same goal, and we can live together. Uh, as one unit uh, family, okay, that are related one with each other and bring peace to the world. So this is really great. Um, long time no see because of Tisha B'Av, because of the things that we had. So now uh, let's dive straight ahead inside and learn a bit about Jacob and Esav. We just came to the verses that Jacob and Esav are coming to this world, okay, getting birth. I will say that uh, we need to remember that it's starting, first of all, with this, that uh, Isaac and Rebecca waited for 20 years to have this, those kids. 20 years, it's a long time. Ask the women for here in this, uh, in this uh, place, okay, 20 years, it's a long time for waiting for kids. Uh, but they were praying. Each one of them in the other side of the room with also for the other one. And after 20 years, they have kids. And let's see for, let's uh, dive straight ahead inside and see the verses and see how it's working. We are in Genesis uh, chapter 25. Um, Please read uh, verses 24, 25, 26. Done. Yes, sir. Uh, 24. And her days to give birth were completed, and behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first one emerged ruddy. He was completely like a coat of hair, and they named him Esau. Uh, and afterwards, his brother emerged, and his hand was grasping Esau's heel, and he named him Jacob. Now, Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. So we have a, um, a few things that we need to realize. But before I'm going to go to dive inside of this, I want to remind us something that I told or I spoke about it, I think, a year ago. And there are two ways how to look about the question, what is the time and why do we need this thing of time? Time, we all know, okay? that from the day that we going out from our, our mother's womb till the day that we are dying, we passing along a lot of things and we are organizing it in a time, uh, I will say stages. First of all, we're sleeping every, usually we're sleeping every day. And secondly, um, we're organizing it like a year, um, months, and uh, we're organizing the time in some sort of a way. The question is, um, how exactly to define time? It's one thing. The main question is, why do we need this thing of time? What is the purpose of time? Now, most of the philosophers are not giving an answer for that. The Hebrew nation is giving a very interesting thing for the reason of time. And basically what they're saying is saying like that. Um, you're coming out to this world and you need to earn your life to buy them you're getting life for free from the moment that we're going out from our mother's womb we are breathing without any cost for the brief for breathing you know good air that's it the photosynthesis is working with the sun and the trees without asking us it's working and we are breathing no one ever asked us for money for breathing if you want to go under the water, you're starting to realize how much is important this oxygen that we are breathing. And you're taking a balloon of oxygen and you need to have a special way, a unique way, unique technique, how to breathe under the water. But we got life and air for free 
without any charge. The Hebrew sages are saying that the reason why we have time is basically to earn the reason why we are living here. This is why every morning we are saying, for giving me another day, and you are you trusting me that I will fulfill my mission here in this world, that I will give back something to this world, that I will give something from the powers that you gave me. And the main question is what will happen with every person in this world after or just before he's going to die? Did he give something back to this world? Did he end his life or not? This is how the Hebrew nation is looking at the issue of time. If you will go to Descartes, for example, the big philosopher Descartes, he says, I, if I'm thinking, so I'm existing. My existency is because I'm thinking. Descartes is not looking, and after him also, everybody said it also before that, is not looking for the reason why I exist. I have a full existence because I have life, that's it. Why? This is it, I got life, that's it. I'm already, when I was born, I was completely or completed with my life and I don't need to earn it. I'm thinking, so I'm existed. That's it. Those are two different ways how to look on life. In the, um, in the philosopher's way, you're looking on life in a way that you don't need to give or to pay back anything for your life. In the Hebrew tradition, when you came to this world, one of the most important things that you need to do is to give life to others, build up a family, and together with your spouse, if you're second side, bring more life to this world. One of the most important things in the Hebrew tradition, you got life for free, give also to others life for free. Good to see you, Jim. Hi. Give to others life, to, life for free. Earn back. Give back to the world things that you got. One of my great rabbis, two weeks ago, we didn't have a lesson because I was with him. Um, he had four times in his life. Today he's 90 years old. Okay. He's very clear. <laughs> it was amazing to be with him. Rabbi Chaim Dutma. He had four times in his life that he was rescued or his life was saved. And each time, the first one was with the Nazis that wanted to kill him. Never mind the four times, it's, it's really amazing his story, his life story. But each time after he was survived, after he survived those terror attack, whatever it was, he said, now I need to give another thing to the Hebrew nation. I got life once again, I need to give something more than what I did. There was a stage in his life for more than 20 years that he was a member Knesset in the, in the how do you call it in English, uh, the politics. He was one of the 120 um, politicians you know, in, the, in our Knesset, in our um, in place. In the, yes, and the, he was sleeping only when he was traveling from one place to another, something around four or five hours a day. A day. And when he wanted to uh, organize an appointment with him, so he told you, okay, come to me at two o'clock. And not two o'clock in the afternoon, two o'clock at night, three o'clock at night. This is when he was speaking with people. He said, I got life once again, so I need to give more to the Hebrew nation back to the world, not only to the Hebrew nation, to the world. So this is how the philosophers are looking in life. On life, I've got life. I'm living here. That's it. I will do whatever I want to do. Okay, maybe I will be a good person. Whatever it is, fine. If you will go, for example, to a Spinoza, he will explain to you that you don't even need to be humility, with humility. Don't, you don't need to be anything. You can be very proud. The humility Spinoza is explaining is only for the wicked people for the masses, so they won't feel too much good on the wisdom people. Okay, but really, you can be very uh, proud and you don't need to have any humility. This is the philosophers or the most highest 
way of the philosophers to live the way of life. The Hebrew nation is saying, no, 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 no. You got life and your life along the years. Give back something. Bring more kids to the world. Raise them up. Do other things for the world. What is the purpose of your life? That when you will be 120 years and you will finish here everything, what, you, what did you give to the world? Because you got the life for free. Pay something for that. Why am I saying all of this? Because this is exactly the differences that we have between two, not twins, but two brothers that we know along history in the Bible. And here we have the second couple. And I want to show this in the first one and in the second one. First of all, let's look in verse number 26. After Asa was born, we have an afterwards, okay, 25, Asa was born. In verse number 26, his brother emerged and his hand was uh, grasping Asa's heel and he named him Jacob. Now, my question is, I'm reminding you, all of us, that the Bible is not giving us examples or words just for, you know, like a journalist. So we will say to ourselves, ah, it's, it's nice words and everything else. Without those words, his brothers emerged. We know that, um, that uh, Jacob is the brother of Asa, right? It's already written down here. Twins. What is twins? They're brothers, right? So why exactly the verse is mentioning to us before the name of this guy, of Jacob, before the name that he was the brother of Esau. This is reminding us, another couple, that before saying the name, we show, we show that he was a brother, okay? Who remember the first couple that you're speaking about? Isaac, Isaac and Jacob. Isaac and Jacob. Is I mean, here. Uh, I, now um, let's go to the first one. Adam and Eve. No, Eve was Cain, 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 Cain and Abel. Oh, let's go to Cain and Abel. Let's see exactly what is written down by Cain and Abel. Abel okay. So please read uh, verses number one and two. Uh, now the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, and she said, I have acquired a man with the Lord. And she continued to bear his brother Abel. And Abel was a shepherd of the flocks, and Cain was a tiller of the soil. Again, what is coming before his name? His name is Abel, but before that, what is coming? That he was a brother for Cain. We don't know that. She, con she continued to bear. So she, she, it's his brother, right? I want to remind us all. Two things um, with Hebrew language. Two things that I already said, but we can remind ourselves from time to time. The word brother in Hebrew is coming from the word someone else. And also coming from the word responsibility. Ach, brother, ach. Achel, someone else. Achrayut, responsibility. Okay? The word brother here and also with Jacob and Esau is not describing the relationship between Esau and Jacob or the relationship between Cain and Abel. It is describing the the purpose of life for each one of them. The responsibility that each one of them have. Now let's look again, and I'm going to explain another word in Hebrew, okay? The word Cain. The word Cain in Hebrew is everything is mine. I brought everything. I have everything. I don't need to pay anything for a... What is happening in just a moment? I don't need to pay anything for living this life. Everything is mine. I want to remind us for a moment the situation of Adam and Eve. While God is all the time giving us, giving us life, giving us 
gave Adam and Eve also clothes. He's giving all the time. Adam and Eve are in the state that they're only receiving. So they're very far from God. God is the one who is giving and they're all the time receiving. They're just the opposite than God. Their mind is just the opposite, the opposite than God. And when Cain is coming to this world, suddenly the Messiah came. They are not only receiving, what are they also doing? They are giving life to someone else. And Cain is working, walking in this world. And like that, very proud. Remember the word proud? I'm here. I'm the only one. I'm the most important. I'm the Messiah for my parents. I don't need to give a damn to anything. I don't need to do anything. Everything is mine. I can live here white and straight. I even repaired my parents from their fathers of God. They were very far from God. Now they're not so far from God. And the word Cain in Hebrew is everything is mine. Kaniti. And this is what she's saying. Kaniti ish Hashem. I bought, I acquired this man. And what is the second one? The second one, the word Abel is nothing. Okay. Cain is looking at the second one and saying he's nothing for me. But the mission of Cain is to be a shepherd. For the mission of Abel, sorry, for the second one, is to be the shepherd of Cain to teach him that there are other people in this world. The brotherhood. The brotherhood. Cain doesn't know any brotherhood. Cain knows only himself. What will happen to the end of the story? Cain will kill Abel. He doesn't, he doesn't care. He is, he is, I don't need him here. I can organize my, my life without him. He is a spare. I don't need him. Okay. Let's jump back. So what is happening here in Genesis? We have a twins. This is the mission of the first one. The word Asaph in Hebrew is from the word Asui. He is done. He doesn't look for anything. He doesn't need to pay anything in his eyes. He doesn't need to pay anything for living his life. I'm already done. Look good and look careful and you will see in the verse, even in the English, that the translation is not 100%. Who called him Asa? Who named him his name? Everybody. They named him, named him Asa. He's coming to this world in a completeliness way. He is already completely. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need to pay anything. He doesn't need to give anything to anybody else. And the second one that is coming, it's not to say that the relationship that he, it's his brother. It's to say the purpose of love of Jacob. The purpose of life is to teach Asaph that there is another one in this world. To live together. They're not to live together in a way that I'm the master, Asa, I'm the master, and Jacob, you are the my servant. Not to live in a way to say, okay, Jacob, you are the master, I'm your servant. To live in a way to understand that I, Asa, have something of the image of God, and you, Jacob, also have something from the image of God, and we need to complete one each other not that I'm completely by myself. Jacob understand his mission. He's a brother. Asaph, not really. Not 100%. We can see that in the continuous of the story, okay, where we find suddenly that the, um, let's see, a very hard verse. Ready to read hard verse. Those who have very um, soft heart. Close the mic microphone for five minutes. Okay? It's not going to be a nice verse here. Um, 
Let's see if it's here, just a moment. I think it's the main chapter. No, 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 it's the main chapter. You can move here a bit, it cannot bother me. Um, Please read verse number 20, 41. 41. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing that his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, Let the days of mourning for my father draw near. I will then kill my brother Jacob. Amazing. Again, now you can open the microphone. Okay? It is really hard. Think about this for a moment. He is not saying, I'm going to kill Jacob. I'm going to kill my brother, Jacob. He understands the meaning of Jacob and his role in history. It's a bit better than what happened with Ken and Abel because at the end we know that he didn't kill him. Okay? We came to a better stage. He's trying to end his role. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's really hard. Think about this for a moment. What's happening here? He hated him, so he said to himself, I'm going to kill him. At the end of history, I'm going to put Jacob and his kids and all of his family in the chambers, in the gas chambers. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill them. I don't want to see any one of them. He won't manage. But this is what he is saying. Now we're starting to realize that the history is coming back from Cain and Abel to Asaph and Jacob, two different ways of looking on things. And now I'm going back to things that we spoke last time about the difference of how exactly Isaac look on things and how Rebecca look at things. What is happening here? Please read verse number 27. 27, 27 and the youths grew up and Esau was a man who understood hunting a man of the field, whereas Jacob was an innocent man dwelling in tents. Fair enough. Now we have here two things, two different points of view. One of them is inside the tents. In those days, uh, the meaning of this is inside the house, inside the town, inside the environment that is organized for people to live together. And there is also the other side, the side of the field. What is the field? Field that is the outside. The wildness. Who is the most um, rolling in the field? The one who is most um, strong is rolling in the field. It's working differently. It's the jungle. In the jungle, the most strong person, person, animal, whatever it is, is rolling there. Asaph is managing to deal with the outside world, while Jacob is dealing with the inside world, where the people is among them. This is where we can read in verse number 28 that Isaac loved Asa because his gain was in his, his mouth. Okay, or it's a bit, uh, it's not a good, the most uh, best uh, translation. But Rebecca loved Jacob. We see here some sort of a split. We said already once that the idea of Jacob, of uh, Isaac, was to give to both of them to become the Israelites. For the world, Asa being the one who is the king that is controlling outside, feeling very strong and everything else. And Jacob will be the moral person to teach Asa how to behave with the other nations. This is what Isaac thought. We know on the other side that Rebecca had a, a prophecy from God. Please read verse number 23. Twenty-three, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two kingdoms will separate from your innards, and one kingdom will become mightier than the other kingdom, and the elder will serve the younger. So she already knows, again, we said it already more than once, the Lord God said, to whom who said it? Only to Rebecca. He didn't say it to Isaac. Isaac have one uh, idea in his mind how to Refrain those two kids while Rebecca knows already that it won't work together. She already knows this uh, idea that will come at the end where 
Amazing. Asaph wants to kill a prophecy. Uh, the pro uh, and Asaph would like to kill Jacob, and she will tell him. Please read verse number 20, 42. 42. And Rebecca was told of the words of Esau, her elder son, and she sent and called Jacob, her younger son. And she said to him, Behold, your brother Esau regrets his relationship to you and wishes to kill you. So this is why you need to, to run away and everything else. So Rebecca, I will say with, my, with two legs on the ground, she understands much better what is happening here between those two, while Isaac is somewhere up there in heaven with a lot of ideas that won't be able to become a, in, a poor, in a true way in, in the situation here. Uh, and we already learned this continuous of the, I will say, the key that we have here all the time. Two words, the word Anochi, the word Anochi is reminding us the word of God, what we said, this partial, we read it, the Ten Commandments is starting with the word Anochi Hashem Elohecha, I am God, and it's reminding God in this world, the Torah, and we have on the other side, the word um, Anochi is also reminding us God and the relationship that we have to the world to come. And the other word that we have, the word Hazeh, here in this world, Esau wants only this world, while uh, Jacob, we did it, I think, two, uh, three weeks ago, something like that, I explained it. The, 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 um, the interesting, I will say, code wording that is running here in, this, uh, in those two, three, four verses is that Esau wants this world, while Jacob also agrees to have the world to come. At the continuous of the history, Asa will become the Christian world. Okay? Something that I'm hinting you that will happen. Um, how come Asa is becoming the Christian world? Uh, it is an interesting story how it's happening. I can tell you something here. I know that it's on the internet, but I will tell this. I can tell you something here that uh, in the last uh, seven years, Rabbi Shekhi and me, we're getting a lot of a, a lot of people that are high rank in the Christian world asking to meet us and to speak with us. We're not saying no to anybody. We're speaking with everybody. And a lot of times we're sitting down, you know, in the table, and people are saying to us, the people from the Christian world, they're saying to us, um, please accept us as brothers. We are brothers, you know, just like in the beginning. Now, I don't know if you know all the history of the Christian world. The beginning, the first 70 years of the Christian, it was together with the Hebrew people in the same shul, in the same, what we call Bet Knesset, the same places, they davened together, they did everything together. Only after 70 years, there was a separation between um, the Christian people and the Jewish people, the Hebrew people. At the beginning, they were all together, families together. It was two different uh, cults in the Hebrew nation. And uh, what we're getting all the time is uh, the, the request to accept that we are brothers, to go back to, this, to the stage of the, 70, the first 70 years. Um, the answer is usually we answer no because uh, uh, by the way, I must say another very important thing. There is a, one of our big sages in the 17th century. He proved from a, this a very interesting article, the article that he, gave, he sent. It's in Hebrew, so it's, I can send it to you. I don't know if you will manage to read it. He's proving from the sources of the beginning of the Christian, uh, of the Christianity, that uh, the main thing that people try to show, to do there, is to build up a, a way for the 70 nations, how to keep the seven laws of Noah, not to be so separated from the Jewish people to exchange them. There are all sorts of reasons in history why it didn't work and the Christian world continued with the imaginary understanding that they're going to replace the Hebrew people. 
And uh, today it's breaking down because, you know, the Hebrew nation <laughs> restored and came back to the homeland against everything that was taught in the Christian world. Fair enough. But the main thing is that Asa became, it's called Edom, it, it became the Christian world. Uh, the Arabs, the Ishmael became the Arabs. And uh, those are the two. And we have the fourth, uh, I will say, culture is the east side of the world. So we have basically four main cultures in this world. The east side, okay, the India, the Chinese, you know, all those things that are more or less the same, something very spirituality. We have the Ishmael side, and we have the Christian side, the Asab, and we have the Israelis. If we will go back to the beginning of, a, of Genesis, we'll go to chapter two. Let's see this for a moment. I skipped it when we've learned it, okay? Now we'll say a few words, not a lot of them. Not, I'm not going to explain everything. There is, a, after God is finishing, the seventh day, it's continuing that those are the generations of the heavens and earth, and we're explaining about what's happening. God created man, and God, the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground, and he breathed in, into his nurses the soul of life, and man became a living soul, and he put him in the Garden of Eden, and then we have four verses, okay? Um, four verses, uh, five, okay? Please read verse from, from 10 to 14, okay? Please. Verse 10, and a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it separated and became four heads. And I four think heads. that's the point you're trying to get across is the entire purpose of the Hebrew nation uh, in this verse. Uh, and then it goes, the name of, the, of one is uh, Pishon, that is the one that encompasses all the land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, and there is crystal and the onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gihon, uh, that is the one that encompasses all the land of Cush. And the fourth, number 14 also, can you read it? Can you scroll it down? Okay. Yes, it and the name of the third river is Tigris. That is the one that flows to the east of Assyria, and the fourth river, that is the Euphrates. So we have here for the, the word Nahar in Hebrew, Nahar, river in Hebrew is the word um, of lightning, the word lightning. Now we know that each, we're speaking here about four cultures. One of them is very glory with the gold and everything else, okay? I'm not going to explain all of them, but you, you understand that the glory, the gold and everything else is the Hebrew, I uh, will say, uh, thing. Um, and there are also another three, like I explained. Um, there is very interesting that it's all starting from one place. Again, look at the unity of the world. If you will go to the hidden side of each one of those cultures, you will see that all four cultures have um, a very similarity of hidden um, foundations. In the Hebrew, it's called the Kabbalah. In the other places, it's called other ways. But if you will go to the sources of everything, it all starts from one river, okay? And the river is flowed out of Eden, and it's giving everything. The main cultures always went along the river. The river is giving water and life. The word river in Hebrew is also lightning. It's giving the the light of the ideas and everything else. Let's remind ourselves that the, what was what was giving, what was what God created in the first day. What God created in the first day, the light and darkness, right? The right way and the darkness. This is the first thing that the light is doing. God is doing. God said, the, "Let there be light," and there was light. Light is the way or the understanding. It's not only light, like we putting on the light and closing the light or shutting it down so we have darkness. Light is also the understanding. How are we showing when someone have a brilliant idea 
We're showing a bulb, a light. Poof, a light. Okay. This is the meaning of the river that we have. So this is basically, I will say, in the four cultures that we're speaking about. Now we're going to speak from now onwards. We're going to explain a bit more about, about Isaac in the beginning of the next chapter. And then we're going to go very deep inside to the main, I will say, conflict that we have between Jacob and Esau in the Christianity, in the Hebrew world. What exactly is happening there and how exactly it's working? Today, it's much easier for us to understand what's happening here. I will continue much more in, in, in the next one, okay? Um, today, it's much easier for us to understand what is happening because we can see the full cycle of the full cycle of history, okay? It's not like in the middle of the history where we don't see yet everything or we are in the middle of something. You know, we always, when you are in the middle of something, it's much harder to see. So what we saw today basically is that there are two ways how I think that, and this is a moral, uh, I will say, view of the things that we saw. And this is very, in a parallel way, very um, exactly what happened in uh, Abel and Cain, also with Jacob and the and Daisaf, with a very interesting uh, difference. Abel didn't have the possibility to stand up for himself. Therefore, he passed away from this world. Jacob, and we all know the continuous of the story, but Jacob is going to have also a change in his name, right? And we said more than once, the name in, in the Hebrew tradition is the same word of purpose in life. So the purpose of Jacob is going to be a double purpose. We thought, or Isaac thought, that these Jacob and Esau, together, both of them are going to um, control the world, to lead the world in the field side and in the inside side, side okay, Jacob and Esau. But Esau, in all sorts of reasons, is being rejected, not fully rejected. I will say something very important in a moment. But Jacob is going to get his rule in another name. What is another name? Another purpose in life. Instead of what Esau is not giving him, we have it. This is, didn't, it didn't happen in, in uh, Abel. This is, didn't have, it didn't happen in Abel. It only is happening only in, in Jacob. Very important point that I must mention is this uh, thing, okay? Um, She, we know that Rebecca is sending Jacob and she's saying to him, please read verse number 30, 45. It's a very important verse. 45. Until your brother's rage subsides from you and he forgets what you did to him and I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft of both you on one day? She's asking a very simple thing. Okay. Now I'm asking you, if Asaph is going to kill Jacob, who said that also Esau is going to get died in the same day? What exactly is she's hinting here? So let me tell you the story. Okay, it's a story that it's not it's not a known story, but this is something that will explain a bit more how the sages of Israel is looking on the relationship between Esau and Jacob, between the Christian and the Hebrew um, nation. Okay, the story is going like that. At the end of Jacob's days, he died in Egypt. And he said to his sons, to his kids, take me to the cave, to the doom of the, what we call the Me'arat HaMachpela, the cave of the, where Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and the Rebecca, and also Leah is being there. And also we know that Adam and Eve are there. So they took him, and it was, you know, the last uh, chapter of Genesis is very describing a very, very um, big ceremony that happened there with the Egyptians, with the people in Canaan. Everything is fine. And they're coming to the cave and they want to bury Jacob. And I'm saying, just a moment. Uh, Jacob died. 
But with all of the respect, I have also a Persian in this cave. It's my father and my mother also. They inherited to me also part in this cave, in this uh, cave, in this uh, doom. I want to be buried here. Why are you getting to be buried here and not me? So they didn't want to do. They didn't know what to do, the kids of Jacob. And they sent Ayala, Ayala I'm sorry. They sent uh, one of the kids, they sent him to Egypt to bring the certificate that Isaac gave to Jacob the place to get buried in the in his doom and not Asa. So it will, it will take him a day or two. In the meantime, there was one of the grandkids, okay, his name is Hushim, the son of Dan. One of the grandkids it was uh, someone who was, uh, he didn't hear, hear in his ears, okay? He was deaf, deaf person. And he said that, you know, he also didn't know how to speak, okay? Deaf and also, how do you say it in English? He didn't know how to speak, mute, yes. So he said to them, oh, and they said to him, you know, this guy, they pointed on Esau, this guy is not giving us to bury Jacob, your grandfather. So he was so angry on this. So he took his sword, sword and he took Esau's head off. He killed him. He took his head off. But his head is buried. And they buried also Jacob. And the head of Esau is buried in the doom of the Me'arat HaMachpelah with Jacob. What is the meaning of this story? Okay, it's a nice story for the kids, for the kindergarten. Let's say stories for the kindergarten. There's a meaning here. There's a very deep, very profound meaning for what's happening here. The meaning of this is that we're saying that maybe the hands, the hands, the behavior of Asaph, a long history, wasn't so good. But there is something there that he used his head, I will call it like that, okay? There are a lot of things that he brought to the world in the right way, and we need to use it. I will say it in those, in those words. There is a very big difference if the world uh, have the Torah and the world is a, a very um, low world in the, I will say, it's not a, it's not a, a modern world or the Torah is in a place where it's already established and modern place. There is something here with Asa that brought to this world the philosophers, um, the mathematics, the, all the progress of the world. There's something here in the head of Asa that is bringing the world to a better stage that the Torah can come to this world to a better place. Therefore, Asa is also part of this continuous of this doom, starting from Adam and Eve, with the patriarchs <coughs> of the of the of the Hebrew parents, okay, Abraham, say, Abraham and Sarah, J Isaac and Rebecca, and also uh, Jacob and Leah. Rachel was buried in somewhere else, and also the head of Esau. Something that in Esau is still very important, very. Um, connected to the continuous of the world. So now we're starting to see a very, I uh, will say, broader picture about Asaph. It's true that he's saying, well, the verses that we are learning now today, Asaph is more, I will say, the opposite than righteous, okay? He's much more a wicked man, but it's much more complicated to speak about this in this way. And it's true that Esau is also, at the end of the days, is doing tshuva, repentance, much easier than Ishmael. We spoke about this also already. Okay, and if you will see here, we have, we have Muslim people, okay, that are coming to the Noahide World Center. But most of the people are coming from the Christian world today and not from the Muslim world. And there's, there are reasons for that also. I showed here, I will say some sort of a full picture about Esau and Jacob. The most important side is to look on the way of we got life. 
how are we uh, dealing with this that we got life for free? Are we looking at this as something that we need to try to earn it, to give something back to the world? Or we saying to ourselves, okay, I got it, that's it. I don't care for anything else. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, God. Or even without thank you, whatever it is, that's it. This is one of the most uh, important things in a moral stage, how to look on this. And this is being hinted with the words, his brother, before even his name, with Abel and also with Jacob. Jacob is a bit um, repairing the sins of Abel, who didn't manage to repair himself. And Jacob is managing in some sort of a way to teach Esau something. I know that Esau at the beginning is hated to Jacob and everything else, but at the end, his head will be also in the doom of the Merat HaMachpelah. There's something that he's managing to repair. And, uh, and this is the mission that Jacob has, and he will get another name with another purpose in his life to complete him, himself in the best way, to be the brotherhood for the world, to teach the world that each one and one of us is with the image of God. Therefore, it's not that I'm controlling you or you are controlling me, or both of us are nothing, but both of us are supposed to give space one to each other because each of us have the image of God in the individual level and also in the nation's level. I think this is for tonight. Yeah, yeah. which is exactly <laughs> what the Christians try to do is to control each other and uh, yeah, lord over each other and it doesn't end. Uh, by the way, uh, very nice that you're saying it. I will say it in a few ways. <laughs> Let's say, let's say, for example, let's look for a moment. I will show what you're saying. And you know, when, uh, for example, um, the French, okay, the French Revolution, and they said that they, they need to bring to all of the world the French Revolution. That's it. They fight it with all of the world and they captured everything, they conquered everywhere. And they said, now you need to be like French people. And they started to teach all, all places that they, uh, the forefathers of Algiers and other places is the ancient Gallis. Gallis. <laughs> the Algier people wasn't from the Gallis. They came from something uh, from the Philippines. That Filikis. explains the Quebecers here in Canada. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, let's go continue on a few years later. The Russian people did the same thing. Let's go a few years later. Okay, They did it to all the Baltic uh, countries. They did it also to the Uzbekistan and the other places there. Everybody's supposed to be Russian. They're doing the same thing now, part of the fight today, okay, with the Ukraine. Now, uh, you know, everyone who conquered somewhere else, the England people, okay, they conquered um, all the India side and they forced them to become Christians. Now, 100 years later, they did a very good thing. When you're looking at this today, what happened? They left all their idolatry. They became Christian. Move three generations later, they're starting to ask more questions. They don't get any answers. What's happening? You know how many communities we have in India of Noahide communities? <laughs> we have thousands of people of communities of Noahide in, in India because they're living, they, they're saying to themselves, we never were Christians. You see how God is moving the head of Asa to become, but on the one side, it's very, um, and it's a very strong way to try to force everybody to become like you. No, no, wait a minute, you know. I'm not controlling you, not, you're not controlling me. Leave, give me space to live, and I will give you space to live. You're a master because you also have, um, I will say the image of God, and I'm a master, I have an image, image of God. Let me respect you, you will respect me. The beginning of the learning of the material, the halachot, the uh, commandments between men and his fellow men, is starting with six chapters, how not to, 10 chapters, sorry, how not to harm, if, how not to harm him, how not to steal from him, how not to take from him anything, give him space. This is the beginning. You have a lot of chapters teaching a lot of things that related, are related between men and his fellow men. But this is the beginning. How not to board a fire that will harm someone else? Be, be careful how to do those things. 
And if you do those things, well, how much you need to pay for that? You're a master and I'm a master on the personal level and on the nation level. Fair enough. Questions, Beautiful. people, you want to ask uh, things and everything else. Uh, Rabbi, and, uh, James, just, just one thing, James, I must say that your last uh, email, <laughs> thank you very much for that. With all of the things that people are not asking questions, and thank you very much for that. Okay. Yeah, yes, I just I, I wanted to ask, um, is that the oral tradition um, uh, where you get the story uh, of uh, Esau's beheading, or is there any any um, any writings um, that no, in the, it's written down in the midrash? The midrash. I can find you the midrash. It's I can find you the Hebrew side straight ahead. The problem is not the Hebrew one. So it's a midrash that is explaining what happened there, and the. I think that Rashi is also mentioning something. I will find. Give me, give me this week, and I will try sure. to find it. Thank you, Rabbi. Beautiful lesson. Okay, people have any questions, any notes, anything that I want to speak to say? Uh, I'm here. I got a question, <laughs> Rabbi. Yes. Um, is there any indication that? Um, Rebecca knew to keep the um, that information from Jacob that God had given her. I said uh, the prophecy; it's written down that the prophecy was only for Rebecca. God said to yeah. her, "Again, I'm I, I'm asking to remind us. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Every word in the Bible, it is not." A journalist who is writing things. Mm -hmm. It is God, and it's He is teaching us in every word what exactly His aim, what He wanted, everything else. There's also a reason why God separated the knowledge between um, Isaac and Rebecca. And by the way, if you look at this, we will see that in the three generations, always when there was a debate between the mother. And the father, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, also then Rachel and Leah and Jacob, okay. always the women's side won. Mm -hmm. Something to to be in, in you know, <laughs> in the right mood. Always um, God is with the women's side. It's written down. It's written down. I can show you this. This I can show you straight ahead. It's written down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, no that that was that was that was part of my question, Rabbi. Was was that um, like I I I'm I'm inferring that there's a lesson there between husband and wife, but I'm wondering where the boundaries are of what husband and wife share between what they know, and if there's any indication of that. You know, um, I, I will say it like that. I'm going to say, it. first of all, I, these shadows <laughs> yesterday, okay, uh, just a moment, let me show this for a moment. Just a moment. Uh, Rabbi, wouldn't it be the difference like when uh, um, uh, Jonah, uh, that Hashem told Jonah to go to Nineveh? In this case, um, he let uh, uh, Rebecca know that this message was for her. Uh, I, I don't understand why you're saying. Uh, In other words, know. she wasn't she wasn't told uh, when it says that the Lord uh, said to she, her, he didn't tell her to 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 tell, to tell or, or to share. Exactly. It's like when exactly, Jonah exactly. Jonah was told to go to Nineveh. Uh, some of the other Navi were told to go uh, say, like like Jeremiah. Yes, they were told right. to go and you're say right. to you're specific right. places. Exactly, but please read for a moment verse number twelve. Uh, this is chapter uh, twenty-one. Please read verse number twelve for a moment, please. Twelve. And God said to Abraham, "Be not displeased concerning the lad and concerning your handmaid. Whatever Sarah tells you." 
Hearken to her voice, for in Isaac will be called your seed. Whatever Sarah told you, hearken to her voice, right? If I remember correctly, Rashi is saying you something amazing. Okay. Uh, I think it's here. Just a moment. Yes. Yes, read it. Hearken to her voice. Hearken okay. to her voice. The voice of the Holy Spirit within her. We learn from here that Abraham was inferior to Sarah in prophecy. I'm not inventing anything, right? right? Mike, Mike, you know, look look good on your side and remember who oh, you know. <laughs> that's got to hurt, Mike. <laughs> the thing is, Dad, who's a matriarch, is my wife a matriarch? <laughs> Listen to your wife, okay? <laughs> I will show you. <laughs> don't, 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 don't. Uh... <laughs> Don't do any concerts. Um, I will show you another thing. Okay, let me We've show done you. 37 thing. years, Rabbi. I think I've listened. Very good. Very good. I will show you another thing. Okay, let me show you another thing. Again, it's it's it, we need to, to understand. Uh, oh, come on. What happened? 37, please. I think it's 37. Let's see. If I'm in the right place. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Fair enough. Um, look here. Look, look, in a moment, just to show you, and then I will tell you something about uh, what is. Please read for a moment. Uh, no, no, not here. Sorry, 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 sorry just a moment. Sorry, it's even before that. Ah, I missed it. Please read those uh, three verses, please. The first three verses here. Okay. okay, one. And he heard the words of Laban's son saying, Jacob has taken all that belonged to our father, and from what belonged to our father, he has amassed this entire fortune. And Jacob saw Laban's countenance that he was not disposed toward him as he had been yesterday and the day before. And the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your forefathers and to your birthplace, and I will be with you. So we have here three reasons why Jacob is supposed to run away from Laban, right? First of all, he sees that they don't really like him anymore. <laughs> Second thing, um, he, he sees that also Laban himself, not only his kids, don't like him. And God is telling him, go back to your homeland, right? Fair enough. If I was here, Jacob, what am I going to do? I'm going to go back to my homeland, right? Now we have, listen, good. Eight verses where Jacob is calling Rachel and Leah and trying to convince them to go back to his homeland. Eight verses. <laughs> and only at the end, they're saying to him, at the end, in verse number 14, Rachel and Leah replied and said to him, do we still have a shared anything? Huh? And the saying to him, so now all that God said to you, do. Let's go back. Why do we need to have so many verses to convince Rachel and Leah? God told him, <laughs> what, what else do we need? He sees already the anti sentiment from uh, Laban and his sons, how much they want to kill him. God is telling him, well, no, you know why? Because one of our great sages from the Kabbalah sages, he's teaching us like that, saying to us, even if God's saying to you to do something, if your wife doesn't want to do that, this is not the way that God wants you to do it. You need, you need to be with a relation with, with your wife. To do it together with her. Even if you God is saying, even God saying to you to do something, you need to bring your wife to a stage that she will agree with that. And if not, this is not the way that God wants wants you to do those things. Now, I have one of my sons. I don't know if you remember. Um, he got married uh, five months ago, something like that. He got married. And this uh, Shabbat, we had something in the family, and I was uh, we were sitting one next to each other, and we spoke. And I showed him um, 
uh, I will say the principle of a course uh, that is related with the relationship between husband and wife. And I told him, you know, I need to do a course for the Noahide. Here are the 10 stages of this course. And look, I showed him everything. And I, I showed him because he's a young, you know, he's just got married. He said, well, it's, it's good. It's a good one. Do, do this as a course for the Noahide people. So it's a bit uh, hard to answer a question like that in a... רבי יואל, אני באמצע שיעור לבני נוח, אני אחזור אליך עוד, אני באמצע שיעור לבני נוח, אז אני, אני אחזור אליך או יותר מאוחר, או עוד איזה חצי שעה או מחר. מחר, מחר, מחר בבוקר, בסדר גמור, תודה. להתראות ביי, תודה. אוקיי, so it's a bit hard to answer in one leg, you know, in, in standing in a moment and saying to you this and this, it's not in a nutshell. It's not something, you need to understand the relationship. It's contained from 10 different angles, how to do this in the right way. And it's all the time a balance. And you're learning all the time and you're growing up all the time. But we see all the time how much, I will say another thing that we learned it really long time ago. And I think that most of the people here didn't saw that. So I will show this. I, I said that the, Sarah is much more important in prophecy than Abraham, right? He showed it. I showed it. I want to show you, want to show you the root, the source of this. Okay. And the source of this is coming in the Garden of Eden. We showed it once. Let's go to the story of the Garden of Eden. And it's just the opposite way from the Christian world. Okay. Um, I'm not going to show all this thing of the Garden of Eden. Also, for this, I owe you a course, a new course that will explain a lot of things. But I wanted to show the main thing that is happening at the end. Do, um, please read for a moment in verse number 24 and try to be very careful. No, 20, 23, 24, okay? 23. And to be, and all of you, before, before, just a moment, before you're going to read it, explain to me why God decided or what is the reason God decided to take out Adam and Eve from Eden, from the Garden of Eden, please. And the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the soil whence he had been taken. And he drove the man out and he stationed from the east of the Garden of Eden the cherubim and the blade of the revolving sword to guard the way to the tree of life. Who exactly is, is being kicked out of Eden? Adam. Only Adam. Eve wasn't kicked out from Eden. The reason is to till the soil okay, where he was being taken. I, I, I saw a few verses before that God is punishing Adam to till the soil and punishing Eve that it will be hard for her to give birth. Okay? The giving birth today with the epidural thing, it's not so hard. Okay, if you're taking epidural, it's hard. I'm not saying, I think that if the, if the men's side was supposed to give birth, we were giving only one kid and that's it. Only women can give more than one kid. <laughs> okay, they're very brave. But it says here, why God is kicking out Adam from the Garden of Eden? So he will fulfill his punishment. And he is kicking out only the men outside. God never kicked out the women outside. We can't, the men's side, okay? We can't really live in this world here without the women. So they did us a favor and they came also. Think about this in this way. So they are much in a higher level, spiritual level. By the way, this is also the blessing that we have. While in the blessing of the men, we're saying, you know, um, the men is saying, Thank you, God, that you didn't, you know, oh, bless you, God, that you didn't did me a woman, a woman. The woman is saying, thank you, God, that you did me as you wanted me to be. What is more higher? God created the women in the right way, in the right shape. Man is, you know, something there, not really 100%. But again, it's a very long explanation how to behave in a daily basis. There are 10 
stages that we need to realize and we are learning all the time and we're staking and after we're staking, we're learning again and we do repentance one to each other. We forgiving one each other, we continue and growing up after 37 years, us, Angela and Mike, we are very strong together. Okay, great, keep people right. Okay, but uh, this is, uh, ah, excellent hands, also great. So this is a, this is something that we need to learn, we need to, to understand. Very helpful, thanks Rabbi. Fair enough. Excellent. Okay. Uh, one more question, or we go closing for today. Thank you so much. You uh, gave us uh, a lot to think over. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome, and you are more than uh, welcome to come every week. It's okay. Uh, by the way, we have already the Brit Shalom book in the Netherlands language. The Brit Shalom book. In the Netherlands language, maybe I need to put it here. Just a moment, I will put it here on the. And we have also, um, we have also, uh, you managed to, you almost uh, finished the, the prayer book in the Netherlands language, we, right? We are busy, we are busy with translating. Excellent. So uh, I am reading, and Egbert is translating the first draft. I'm I'm reading and, and and so we are together busy. Excellent. Uh, let me find just a moment. Uh, so 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 put the link on the on the. It's it's in the Netherlands language, okay? The the British Shalom and everything else in Dutch. So you can also um, read it and learn it. It's how to behave in a daily basis. It's, it's a, yes, the beach. Oh, okay. Okay. It is. We we have the one, we have the one in uh, in English and in Hebrew. But now it's, it's uh, so you can have now that. also mm -hmm. spread it to the others. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes, great. Uh, with Bart that did it, organized it. Um, now we have also the Thai language working. We're working in other languages. We will have the seventy languages. Um, by the way, yes. Yes, 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 please. Okay, yes. uh, uh, Venio online on uh, YouTube is asking, can you explain the term his image as it relates to creation when he created man in his image? I, I will say something very simple, like the Maimonides is explaining, okay? In the image of men, he created him. In his image, in the image of men, not God's image. Very simple. In his image, in the image of man, he created it. This is what is written down also. It's written down. In his image, in the image of man, he created him. Very simple. Not in the image of God. God doesn't have any image. <laughs> Tell Daniel that you are missing him here. <laughs> Daniel from Bogota, right? But, but we have also in the Spanish. Um, thank you very, very much, people. It was a pleasure, as usual, to be with you. Uh, and uh, see you all next week. We are all right. So, so we're aiming thing. to have a class next week as well, Rabbi. Yes. yes. Excellent. Okay. So, folks, we're going to sign out for now. Uh, catch the Torah wave. Uh, uh, we, we love this Genesis class live from Jerusalem with Rabbi Chaim Goldberg. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed it. Feel free to like the video on YouTube and Facebook and feel free to share it out there. On social media, we so appreciate it. And uh, till next week, we're going to sign out and uh, wish you all a great week. Bye for now. Good to see you. Have a blessing week.